So it's uh, all for play for still. I think so. Do you want to bet against us? Welcome everybody to Further Love and Paul McGrath podcast in a small, a bit of a different setting. And yes, we have recruited somebody onto the podcast. Um, we haven't really talked terms or numbers or contracts or anything like that, but we have the wonderful Martin O'Neill here and we're hoping to convince him over the next 20 to 25 minutes or so to join the podcast full time. But Martin O'Neill, thank you so much for agreeing to come on. This is a real honor to chat to you today. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. I see, um, I see all the things and anything... I- associated with uh, with Paul is um, is fine by me. <laughs> well, as I say, as people who listen to the podcast knows, he's a big, big figure in my household. Always has been, and uh, yeah, as I say, he's the he's the uh, the man who the who the podcast is named after. But for today, we might just change it up to for the love of Martin O'Neill for the next few minutes, because as you say, you do have uh, we and myself and Paddy have um, uh, a, a very big connection with a lot of your managerial career, obviously with Aston Villa through your time at Celtic, and then also with the Irish national team as well. So um, we're looking to pick your brains on that as, okay. as well um i suppose well, you know I, i've got something to tell you but believe it or not i am um, way back when i was uh, a player and probably obviously in maybe uh, maybe uh, in the latter stages of my career but i got an invitation i think up to, to dublin one one evening to present some prizes to some young people and and um, so this particular prize i'm presenting to this young, young fellow and obviously, I asked the question, you know, what what would you like to do with your life? He said, "No, oh, I'd like to be a professional footballer." And uh, of course, I'm, you know, yeah, of course you do. I know, usually sort of semi dismissive. Although I wasn't semi dismissive, I. Uh, but I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, well, let's see how it goes. And I said, "Well, all the very, very best." Yeah, it was Paul McGrath. Oh, really? <laughs> it was Paul McGrath, honestly. And what a professional he became. So there you are. Absolutely. That's an amazing story. Yeah, yeah, Martin absolutely. didn't even tell us that and beforehand. That's no, brilliant. And I'm, I'm quite sure he was so young, he probably wouldn't have a clue about who this uh, this older footballer was at the time, you know, <laughs> that was presenting the prizes. You know, he probably, probably thought it was just another day out of school, I imagine. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it was Paul McGrath. I remember that distinctly. Excellent. Really. You know, so he hadn't he hadn't kicked a ball in English football at the time, you know. So he was he still he was making his way through. So making his way through probably the St Patrick's Athletic, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Um, and, and I suppose, look, there's, uh, as I say, obviously you have a new book out at the moment and we're all looking forward to getting stuck into it. It was released on the 10th of November. It's available from Pan and Macmillan uh, Publishers. We will share the link for it in <coughs> underneath here. Um, it's getting rave reviews, Martin. I know that a lot of, um, uh, basically the, the excerpts and stuff like that that have come out about it uh, tell some great stories. And I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that the, 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 those excerpts will be filled in with a lot more context as well when we do get our hands in the book. So guys, the link will be in the um in the, the the YouTube notes here and in the podcast notes as well. But obviously, as we are decked out in Aston Villa gear, we are yes. we are we are really really thrilled to get to know a small little bit about your Aston Villa life or that time a period in your life as an as, uh, uh, with Aston Villa it coincided with some really really good times for the club, a bit of stability for the club, a bit of hope, which Aston Villa were crying out for at that period of time coming off maybe. I suppose sometimes of mediocrity. There was a sale to a, to a rich American benefactor. It was after taking over the club, things were looking up, and there was money being pumped pumped into the club. But they needed somebody to come and bring it all together. And Doug Ellis made the phone call to you, Martin. Talk to mm-hmm. us a small a bit about that. I, I've heard you speak about it in and 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 uh, one or two <laughs> other places. I've heard you speak a small a bit about it on Talk Sport today, actually, as well. Talk to us a bit about that, though. Well, Doug, uh, yes. Um, you you will know obviously as being a big Villa f- uh, fanatic that uh, times were difficult then and particularly for Doug you know Doug had been talking uh, for a number of years really about selling the football club but I think that the I think that the fans had just really kind of voted with their feet in the sense that the season tickets were really down uh, David O'Leary had just gone at the stage they were looking for a new manager at the time I'd been at Celtic the previous year and uh, left Celtic you know with uh, uh, then my wife was getting better from from illness, and so a chance to get back into club management. So Doug t- took um, took the opportunity, give me a call, and I meet him at his house. 
Now, at that stage, I think that there was a lot of talk, a lot of talk at that stage about Doug selling, selling up. And in fairness to me, in my meeting with him, he told me that, you know, that, that, that this may well happen, that the only person he really felt that could take the club forward was, in fact, Mr. Lerner and at the time. But, and I, oh, naturally, you know, in terms of self-preservation, you're thinking, well, if Doug appoints me as manager, and then Mr. Lerner steps in and wants somebody else, then it says it's going to be a, short, a really short stay. But in essence, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the chance to meet Mr. Lerner beforehand was one that, uh, that he set up himself and said to me that, listen, you do what you want. He said, I want to, I want to buy the football club. There's no, no complete guarantee. Doug might change his mind at the end of it all. He said, but if I do get it, whether it be in a six weeks time or six, six months time, he said, hopefully, he said, I, I, would, I want to try and keep you on as manager. And therefore, that, that, that was obviously encouraging for me. But uh, Doug was the one that actually appointed me. And um, Doug, Doug, well, I, you know, I know he was called deadly Doug for a reason, because he's, he's usually, the, I think the great Jimmy Greaves gave him that name, you know, deadly Doug for deadly, deadly, um, uh, but um, or um, sacking managers pretty quickly. But overall, it was uh, my experience with Doug, although short, was really, really very, very interesting, I must admit. And um, uh, there, there is actually a story in the book where we, um, we kind of clash early, early on over, over his paying of uh, appearance money to Martin Lawson, who was only on the field for three or four minutes. But it's uh, <laughs> uh, really... But only, but that's, that's the way Doug ran the football club. And, um, and I suppose... Even the even the short meetings I had with him, you know, you you saw a real a genuine strength of character about this fella that he he didn't mind. He honestly did not mind the criticism. He was prepared to to uh, you know charge on regardless, and uh, and that's the way he was running with it, you know. So he very much, he very much did it his own way. He was a, he was some character, Doug. But I think I think Martin, you probably hold the record of the only manager never to be sacked or leave under under Doug. <laughs> That I'm, that I'm quite sure I, I, I would have joined everyone else had I been there for a couple of months. In Martin O'Neill's book, On Days Like These, My Life in Football, Martin speaks honestly about his decision to retire as a player and making the transition to manager. He recalls finding early success with Wickham Wanderers, his move to the Premier League with Leicester City, he talks about his years with Celtic, and also his time with Aston Villa where he achieved three consecutive top six Premier League finishes. Also, Martin delves into his time managing the Republic of Ireland and working alongside his mercurial assistant, Roy Keane. Yeah, and, and, and you know, you, you mentioned there that, that Doug Ellis would, would, would have uh, probably promote, promoted you to the to the fan base from manager position uh, if you'd stayed around there too long. I don't think that that would have been the case at all. I think that you would have done just fine. But I think that that first year, I a lot of people focus on, obviously, the trip to Europe and things like that. I think that first year was a real moulding situation for Aston Villa Football Club. And I think you had to work with, you had to work with tools that, you know, that, that, you needed to get the best out of. Obviously, your first mm -hmm. signing, your the only big money signing that you made before the start of the season was Stilian mm -hmm. Petrov. And how yeah. important was Stilian Petrov to you to be able to try and maybe instill it? Somebody that you had at Celtic, somebody that was going to come in and maybe <clears throat> have words in the ears with people in the dressing room and say, hey, this is Martin O'Neill. This isn't somebody that you've, met, you've, you've played under before and this is how he likes things done. Was that a really important... Was that, would, put it this way. Was that a game, a, a deal breaker for you with regards to no, coming no, to the club? No, I, no, I... Yeah... The, 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 you're right. There wasn't much money around, uh, first of all. Uh, Doug, and I think then when Doug finally made his mind up to leave the football club, then the rest was re relatively plain sailing in terms of getting the deal over the line. But in all honesty, it was, uh, it was Mr. Lerner who really funded, uh, funded Stilly and Petrov. And, um, and <clears throat> we paid the money for him. I, as you've mentioned it to me now, I don't think, I honestly don't think that, um, that I signed Stillian, you know, just to, uh, just to step into the dressing room and tell the people, oh, listen, they know the manager we had at Celtic is a fine manager or something like this year. I don't think so. I really wanted him just to try, I think, think and maybe improve the team. His mm -hmm. debut, lads, was really, really fantastic. Mm -hmm. Played against West Ham, but he was simply sensational. And I thought, well, that's great. That's great news. Great news for myself, great news for Stillian. But then Stillian then, after a while, lost his way a little bit. And uh, in fact, in, uh, I would have said that the, by the end of the season, you know, things weren't going so well with him at all. 
fact, I had to pull him aside and think that maybe maybe he wasn't going to hack it there at, at, at Villa Park. In fairness to the lad, as I knew Stillian had, the one great thing about him, he's got plenty of courage, really courage, both physical and, and um, obviously mental courage. And uh, he said, no, I'll fight my way back into this team. And eventually he did do and became obviously a, 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 a big, strong influence in the dressing room, but also very, very popular with the crowd. And it's only his, uh, his cancer uh, battle that uh, forced him to, to obviously not just leave the football club, but leave, uh, leave football altogether from, uh, from a playing viewpoint. So, no, the first, year was, the first year was one of those where some players you didn't feel were really good enough to play for Aston Villa, even at, at Premier League level. And one or two trying to get your, your own way and get a few few players in, for instance, mm -hmm. signed um, around about the wasn't it the around about the January time where took Ashley Young and big yeah. uh, John Carew. Carew is a real handful. He makes you smile even now when you think about it. John's uh, John uh, was a very, very fine, strong, strong footballer. That's when he had the notion of playing sometimes sometimes playing and John just didn't necessarily always go together, particularly if, you know, if he'd had a, a reasonable couple of days down in London beforehand. <clears throat> I am joking. He was, you, you had to, you had to cajole John into playing, you know, uh, he would take Martin, him. Martin, we know you're not joking. We know exactly what he was capable <laughs> of. <at the> time. <laughs> yeah. He had, yeah, his mother, his mother was still living in Norway, somewhere in Norway and his mother his mother used to be the sort of litmus test for John's fitness. For instance, when he would make a phone call back home, John, she would say, oh, John, I, 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 detect, I detect a sore throat there. Surely you're not thinking about playing on the Saturday, you know, with a sore throat. And, uh, and John might come in to the doctor and, uh, and me and say, well, you know, you know, mother thinks I've got a really sore throat. Well, sorry, mum, you're uh, you, you are a professional <laughs> footballer. You do play with sore throats, you know. That's part of the game. But when he did play and was really at it, he was he was a real handful, you know. But well, Ashley well, Young, great to see Ashley still at the football club now after the length of time he's uh, he was uh, he left and went to Manchester United and then to Italy, and now he's back. And um, yeah, uh, Aston Villa is certainly part of his blood. But you know, to bring him at the time, it was a big risk, really. Um, he had just been playing mm. for Watford, and uh, with all the things that I think he was capable of doing, he certainly produced in the Villa shirt. He he most certainly did. He he was an, he was probably one of your better signings for sure. You, mm. And you you made some great signings, and a lot of people forget that. And there was a lot of money made off the signings that you made as well when we eventually sold them on. Um, just just going back to John Carew briefly, <coughs> would, would would he have been maybe difficult is not the right word to use, but would he would have been the ones that you would have to put the arm around and and coach the most in your time at Aston Villa? I I yeah, John John was that he was uh, he was actually a really 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 good character, unbelievably popular in the dressing room with the lads and really obviously with the fans as well too. But uh, yeah, you. You accept you accepted John for all for all the things he just you just wanted him to uh, you wanted him to be at it all the time and some sometimes your cajoling or encouragement you know uh, might might uh, fall on stony ground at times you know for for John but overall he was he was genuinely terrific for us <laughs> and moving I suppose from somebody like like John Carew into players I think that maybe. I don't know, you might tell us differently that may may not have needed as much cajoling to play. Now, myself and Paddy would often think that we might make a superb <coughs> uh, centre-half partnership, but I don't think we play as well as the likes of Martin Larson and Olaf Melberg. They're obviously two massive names within Aston Villa Football Club. What you got out of Martin Larson and obviously Olaf Melberg at the time that he was with the club was fantastic, and they, they're, they've gone down as a legendary uh, centre-half partnership. But how were they as men and as leaders of that team? Because they seemed like people <coughs> that you wouldn't cross in the dressing room that they seem to be a bit of an enforcer types L L Lawson Lawson was uh, really an incredible character in many aspects when I came to the football club first which was uh, uh, way, way back then in uh, in 2006 and I signed for the football club and went out to Germany immediately because mm -hmm. they were playing I signed on a I think on a Friday night and they were playing a couple of pre-season games before they started the season which was in a fortnight's time and they were playing, and I, that was the first time that I would see Martin Lawson out there. And Martin was actually, he was not just running with a limp, he was actually walking with a limp. And I thought, what is this, is it, you know, what's this all about? 
But Martin, Martin said to me, oh, don't, don't worry too much about this. He said, this will, this, this will disappear. And he said, and I can't, play, I can't play any more than one game per week. I thought to myself, we'd be lucky if they played one game a year. Uh, but he said, no, I, and, but soon he said, I will be able to play two games a week if that's the case. Well, I have to say, I, I, I mean, I kind of left it to him. The one thing about Martin Lawson was this, that, uh, that having, having been in Italy for some time, and particularly having uh, the number of injuries that he had, Martin Lawson was incredibly particular about his, his training uh, and, and, and what he had to do, his fitness regime. He had to do so much. If you ask Martin Lawson to do, let's say, let's say 100 trolley pulls, Martin Lawson would not stop at 99. He would do the 100. You just know that. You could leave him to it. And he was very, very much like Paul McGrath in this sense. Yeah. You said to you said to uh, you said to Martin, you can't train all week. You couldn't train all week, but on the Friday he would come out and join us in five a side. Martin's probably the worst five a side player you've ever seen, <clears throat> but it didn't matter as long as he was getting some some uh, some fresh air and out there away from the away from the um, the gymnasium where he was doing all his work. And then come Friday, uh, he would do this five a sides where he would be particularly poor. But in the Saturday, he was just immense for us. Absolutely immense. You can see him just particularly in the opposition box as well, too, where you think he would just throw himself into, into corner kicks and free kicks. He was, uh, he was terrific for us. Yeah. And with Olaf, uh, obviously, he was uh, he made the difficult decision to leave Aston Villa. I think it was on your watch, if I'm not mistaken. It you was were there absolutely, and he, absolutely, yes. And, and, I think, and yes. conversations think, around that, I presume, were difficult. Yeah, I think that... Um, I think that all have thought then that um, that maybe maybe it was a chance for for pastures new as mm. as as much as anything else at the time and uh, and perhaps you know I I thought that um, I thought that he might have been staying along but you you're never exactly sure what what might be in players' minds but he had this opportunity to let his contract run through and then uh, and then head off so he did that but uh, I know as you say he he did excellently for Aston Villa during my time and obviously he was there before I arrived yeah and but did, he didn't give you any one of those uh, jerseys that he got printed out did he I, everyone I, else I, got one I, I think by the time he had handed them out they'd all gone <laughs> <laughs> Martin, can I ask you two questions about mm. what what is about a transfer that did happen and one is another one and and look as I say one is I want to dis I want to try and dispel a rumor you probably may know what, <laughs> what that second one is but Go the on. first one is how does Mustafa Salifu come across a manager's a manager's desk? Not to say that he was an incredibly poor player or anything like that. I'm not getting, going down that route. But mm -hmm. a player that's playing in the in the Swiss second division on transfer deadline day, and he was signed. And I think there was I remember actually watching Sky Sports News, and they cut back to the studio after it was announced that Mustafa Salifu had signed, and you just saw by the blank faces on people uh, uh, on the TV, they were like. Who the hell is this guy? And but how how does that happen? I suppose. Well, okay, in, in well, last it, it can year. happen. And he was he was my my signing absolutely. Yeah. And it wasn't as if to say that we we're just picking someone up there from from the bus stop. Of course, um, he didn't he didn't cost very much money. We were mm -hmm. trying to build a bit of a squad. And sometimes sometimes for not that much money, you might take a risk on someone that, that you think might have the ability to 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 come through. And so I'd watched a lot a lot of them playing, obviously with. Um, uh, with the uh, with the aid of um, of um, uh, technology and stuff mm -hmm. like this here, and so fine. And for for very little, little at the stage, where I thought, well, listen here, do you know what? He might be. He's every. He looks every bit as technically good as some of the younger players we have uh, there at the time. Mm -hmm. And if you're asking them to come through, he might be that sort of bridge where he's a wee a little bit older might be able to come through, particularly with us playing in European football and not wanting all the time to play the likes of James Milner and, uh, and Stuart Downey and things like this here. But it wasn't that um, Sally Fu didn't, uh, didn't cost too much money. He definitely had ability. He really could, he could actually deal with the ball and he was nice. And, and in training sessions, you thought, oh, listen, he's, he's, he's actually going to be really, really worth it. But at the end of it all, you know, some... Uh, as I said, too, it's not as if he was, he was costing me £15 million and, and throwing it down the drain. He was one of those that I thought that could fill in um, when some of the players uh, couldn't play. And as you well know, mm -hmm. well, uh, imagine I did go to the well with the same players so, so often. Even Alex Ferguson said to me, he said, I don't know how you, how you play those players all the time. And I did do because those were the players I trusted.
Mm. And uh, when the week before we played Manchester United in the League Cup final, even James Milner came to me. And, and if James is coming saying he's feeling a little bit tired and maybe miss out for a week, then you know, then you might have a problem because James was mm. never tired. And so it was really an essence to try and just uh, keep the squad up more than anything else. And hopefully that we would still be maybe in the, in the what shall I say, in the latter stages of European competition. Yeah. And perhaps maybe the likes of Sally Fu could have, could have helped along the way. Yeah. I've got to ask you about this. I think it's, an, look, it seems to be this internet rumour that goes around the place the whole time that Aston Villa were offered Falcao at some stage. Mm. I don't know whether you could confirm or deny that at any at any stage. And we don't know what would have happened, but it always <laughs> gets thrown about whenever the whole Aston Villa signed Hemi Heskey thing comes in, comes into play. And Hemi Heskey, as we know, scored, I think it was on his debut for Portsmouth, mm. and it was an absolute banger. I think it was some sort of a half volley. But whenever you whenever that gets mentioned, Radamel Falcao's name comes up. Mm. Uh, well, I have to tell you this, in all honesty, I do not remember it. I, you think you would do? You I do yeah. not remember that at all. There are, uh, as you would well know, you can imagine during the course of the season, but particularly maybe uh, the month leading up to the transfer deadline or something like this year, that would be players thrown at you from from agents all over the place, yes. yeah. and some some agent may have perpetuated this story. I do not remember Falcao being being offered to me. I absolutely do not remember mm-hmm. that at all, and that's uh, really that's... genuine. And um, and if someone says, "Oh, I put it in front of them," I think that that might be to bolster their own their own, their own particular time, you know. So, I mean, you know, the agents, you know, you can imagine. But I did, I do not the the Falcao thing. I do, I do not remember one jot of it, and my memory is relatively good. I mean, it does fade at times, mm-hmm. and sometimes it's selective, uh, as most of us have. But um, overall, I do not remember Falcao and or me turning Falcao down yep. as a, as as a player. Well there, well, there you go. As I say, he would if he was somebody that came across your desk, he'd definitely be somebody, as you say, that you would have looked up and you would I think, have done the think research. That I, you know what? I think that it might have attracted attention. Do you not think of it? <laughs> maybe, some, maybe considering some, his goal scoring some, record. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. <laughs> For sure. And, Martin, yeah. you, you mentioned the brief. The... Sorry. Yeah, you mentioned Apologies. briefly there about the League Cup final. Um, it's it's something that really irks me over the years when 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 you mention people's <coughs> names. But I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a name at you now and, and give you thirty seconds to discuss Mr. Phil Dowd. Oh, it's, it's, honestly, that's it's and you know what is you talk about it, you talk about career changing moments. Myself and Mr. Lernan perhaps weren't getting on the best at their best at that time, and that there if we had put the League Cup together, won the League Cup that day, which I'm I know that Sir Alex Ferguson is one of the greatest managers ever ever been in the game. And no, no question about it. And sometimes he could win games with nine players. But what with us, with the uh, with the ability we had in the team, with the running power that we had in the side that day, we could have won that game. We take the lead. They have a man sent off. Vidic has left, so it means they have to replace him. You know, and so they'll maybe take uh, may, maybe somebody off the field at the time, a forward player. Uh, we have a great chance of winning the game. And Phil Dowd makes up the rules as he goes along. You know, and that was just a he, he, he just crazy. Crazy, absolutely crazy, and do, that. Do you do you believe if Richard Dunn did that to Michael Owen, he would have stayed on the pitch? Hmm? No, no, Richard... no, absolutely not, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely not, not at all. This is the whole point, and uh, I I I feel sometimes, and uh, and I obviously it's only in my mind that I felt as if when he was making the decision at the time to give the penalty and and then deliberating over what the sending off, I'm sure that he probably saw a grizzled Sir Alex Ferguson staring at his back and saying, don't you dare, don't you dare, you know, but uh, listen, and it was, uh, it was, you know, a decision he made up of his own volition and, uh, and it just wasn't in the rules at the time. And, uh, and I don't, and I know I'm possibly understand the fact that, <coughs> excuse me, that he, um, he might've thought first minute of the game, does this spoil the enjoyment for, for fans watching mm. the game, but nothing to do with that. That's not his decision. No, it's just a season just to abide by the rules. Mm-hmm. And I think, I honestly think that we would have won. We would have been um, in a trophy in the board, which is the most important thing. And um, and Mr. Lern and I may be, may be patching up some differences. You know? And that's, that's exactly it. Like it's a sliding doors moment between, yeah. you know, yeah. you, you, at this point, you would have been the last Aston Villa manager to win a cup. 
you know, yep. if things if things stayed as they were, who knows? You you might have got on to to Champions League football from then on. Who who knows what? Uh, who, if, if we if we put the current owners back to 2010 and you in charge, I, I would just love to see how how things panned out. But oh, unfortunately, honestly, that would be unfortunately it didn't work out that way. Doesn't, doesn't, Martin, doesn't. your book your book is called on days like these, and mm-hmm. I I think you know it, it's a it's a title of a book that resonates with me because football is about days and special days and. You know, you you as a man probably don't realize, you know, the special <laughs> days that you brought. But you, people will always talk about, you know, the, how it ended and how it walked away. But the, the days that brought through that Aston Villa four years was absolutely incredible. There were some amazing performances. Unfortunately for me, I had a young child at the time. and couldn't get over it too often. Mm-hmm. I'm a season ticket holder now and go very often and really? sometimes have to sit through some awful drivel. Mm-hmm. And I wish I should. I, I had the chance to sit through more days. Um, I did. I was lucky enough to to go to a lot of Celtic games while you were there. I went to Anfield to see that mesmerising oh, game. Did you? Oh, great! Uh, great. Absolutely. Great. I never yeah. got to Seville because it was a couple of weeks before I got married. But oh, Christ, I went well, to Anfield. Hey, priorities, priorities. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, made a mess of that one. I didn't see that one coming. But uh, you know, on days like these. That day in Anfield, where, where you could where you could sit in the stadium with a Celtic shirt on in the middle of all the Liverpool crowd, mm-hmm. the atmosphere that night was absolutely spine tingling. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do you remember much of it? Oh, I abso- absolutely do. Yes, you're just going back there before I talk about that there to a- Aston Villa days. Do you know what you talk about? Um, uh, you talk about um, ending. Do you know what? If it to do it over again, I just patch up differences with Mr. Lerner, honestly, and just, and, and stay put, you know, club was great. And uh, yeah, and uh, I, sh- I should have dealt with it better in terms of, uh, in terms of me ending. Absolutely. Should have dealt with it. Should have just got on with the things, accepted what was coming and say, well, okay, yeah, let, let's go for it. Desperately try and get into the, pre- or sorry, into the Champions League. That was like my, my, um, my real ambition for the football club. And we fell short that uh, we fell short well two successive years really where we're very very close and and when i took the team to russia and changed the side round and then uh, and then coming back to what 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 what's all this about you know yeah. and uh, when we were in russia which was to do with uh, us being in the last 32 of the competition it wasn't really as, as if we were in the last eight or something like that so i was desperately trying to push and really with uh, Sir Alex Ferguson's words echoing in my mind, you know, you're pushing the team to the well. So I, some of the players just needed resting up for, uh, for the games ahead. We had about another, what was it, about another 12 games left in the league. And our next game after the Russia event in, in Moscow was really, was Stoke City and Glenn Whelan. Glenn scores a goal. They, um, and uh, Stoke City draw with us when we're 2-0 up with about eight minutes to yeah. go. And Glenn, I keep telling Glenn, I've told him umpteen times, he never scores a goal. He never gets a goal. No, and uh, and then suddenly he should score against us. But uh, yeah, it was great. Anyway, such is life. It, 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 was, it, wasn't, it wasn't the only time that Glenn <laughs> Whelan uh, started the downfall of an Aston Villa manager. He missed a 96-minute penalty to cost Steve Bruce's Steve job Bruce's, as well. His oh, job as well that's so. fine. That's absolutely right. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, gosh. So uh, yeah, there we go. Well, that's uh, even even greater consequences than that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the you're talking about the the Liverpool, the atmosphere, Anfield was fantastic, matched only by the atmosphere at Celtic when we played them in the first leg. But for us to go and win the game was great news. Great news for Scottish football as well too, mm-hmm. because you know we're always being compared um, unfavorably with England, and and quite rightly so because there's not the same money in the game. Celtic and Rangers seem to stand alone. And uh, and the other teams seem to in, in the league seem to fall by the wayside a little bit in terms of in terms of money, and then all you do, <coughs> all you need is like Celtic and Rangers not to not to have had the best competitions in the Champions League this year for for people to throw disparaging remarks up again. So that's very obvious, and it was something that even then, even though I felt that the league, the Scottish league, was much stronger with Aberdeen and and uh, D- uh, Dundee and Dundee United been stronger most mostly uh, than the teams that they are now today you still have to you still have to play those games and then step up to European football midweek and that was what I was really pleasing about the team that I had at Celtic we could do that we could step up into the in, into the big leagues you know and uh, and compete and, and compete well 
we got uh, nine points from the first time that we were ever in the Champions League. Nine points and didn't get through to the to the um, to the knockout stages. Really disappointing. Then Bobo Baldi handles the ball against uh, Leon in the last minute yes. of the game. Otherwise, we're through. Oh, you know what? If I'd been big enough, I I could have I could have dealt with him. You know. <laughs> You know, in fairness, there's not many men in this world big enough to deal with Bobo. No, oh, you're dead right. Bobo was a unit, a unit for sure. Paddy's Paddy has actually been to see a lot of uh, great games that, that that you managed in as well. He was in Lille for that famous day, obviously turning our oh, attention to the, to the Irish game. I uh, was. Um, he was in Lille in that day where we once again did our party trick of beating Italy in a big tournament. Oh, <laughs> so brilliant, Paddy! You so you've been to a few of the games. It's really good. Oh, Lille yeah. was a real Lille was really special. You know, Robbie Robbie Brady's heading in. Yes. He's he's gone as brave as a lion. He doesn't care what's going to be in front of him, and he's gone. There. And it's going to head that ball into the net. Just fa- absolutely fantastic moment, really fantastic. Yeah. There was me still cursing Wes Houlihan for missing a <laughs> yeah, yeah, about, yeah. about 35 seconds before that. And I think <laughs> if I get anywhere near him in this dressing room, I'll oh yeah. And he, he floats the one in, and then comes in comes Robbie to head it into the net. Oh, listen, fun, really, really lovely moments, I must admit. Yeah, mm. yeah absolutely. And and I, I had my 11 year old son with me uh, that day and you know for, for like I was lucky enough that my father brought me up on football and it's so important that people remember what managers <laughs> did which is great that you can come on and tell your story to everybody that will listen because you, you know a, a guy like you deserves to have a book written and I love the fact that you've written this book yourself because Thank you know I, I'm looking forward to this book arriving in the post to read it and hand it on to my son for him to read it for him to read it about those halcyon days at <coughs> Celtic to to read a, read back on that that journey through fans that he went on which was absolutely mind blowing and incredible and you know to to stand there and and feel his heart beating out of his chest uh, with 90 oh, minutes on the clock it was not absolutely nothing like it and I actually feel sorry for people that aren't football people because you know it's experiences like that yeah. that stay with you till the day you die. Yeah, and uh, Mar- really, thank you, Martin. Uh, I just like to say my adoption papers to become Paddy's son. They're, they're in the process of being cleared <laughs> off at the moment. Yeah. Actually, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I wish yeah, I wish good. that was the case. <laughs> Brilliant, Martin. Brilliant. We did. We I did bump into you a couple of times. The, the very first time I met you, 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 you probably ran away from me. It was the day Tommy Johnson scored the. The goal to win the league against, I think it was yep. St. Mirren. Yep. And I, I was slightly inebriated by the time I bumped into you <laughs> at about 10 o'clock that night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, down in the thing. Oh, I'm brilliant. Bro, oh, fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, listen, for me, uh, just to win the league there with Tommy scoring the goal as well, too. So, uh, just yeah. a, uh, another, another big hero for Aston Villa, yes. too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Super yeah. Team Tommy team. did. Absolutely. Funnily enough, I'm going over at the end of the month to. <clears throat> present some uh, prizes in, in Belfast he's uh, yes. he's uh, working now he's, uh, he's doing some coaching and some of the young coaches are getting their badges as well too so I'm just doing a little little presentation with him so it'd be nice to see him again for a while absolutely. Uh, yeah yeah absolutely so Tommy you genuinely lovely lad really lovely lad uh, he says that um I said that uh, why did I sign why did I sign Chris Sutton? I said, Tommy, well, honestly, with respect, I said, you weren't going to be partnering Henrik Larsson for too many <laughs> games. You know? I jokingly said to him, we need to win some of these games, you know. So that's why. But um, but he was in uh, no, he he really fine, Tommy. Fine, yeah. really, really good lad. Mark, I know we're really, really you. conscious that we're, we're taking up a lot yes. of your time. So I, I have a six million dollar <laughs> question for you that everybody wants to know. Mm-hmm. You may you may or may not be able to answer, but we're going to ask it anyway. Well, what happened with Jack Grealish and, and why didn't he declare for Ireland? Right. OK, it's really. Do you know what? You can talk to, to your blue in the face with these things, but the, the answer is incredibly simple, really simple. Jack Grealish wanted to play for England. Really did, and and no amount of of cajoling or encouragement uh, was going to change his mind. And here's the point, Barry, that Jack was born in England, so I I think you know the the, the first thing that you should think about that. But Jack's dad was also born in England, so you know Jack, while he loved his time playing for the Republic of Ireland, it's uh, uh, at youth team level and things like this here. There was all the minute the minute that he was going to be good enough. And remember some of these games he was playing, maybe he was not really making much of a, an impact at Aston Villa as a kid at the time. 
but but somewhere along the way this lad had the talent you just knew it was going to shine through and uh, and so jack Grealish wanted to sign for uh, to sign for the country of his birth it really really as simple as that there and to dissuade him of that in many aspects would would wouldn't have really been right all their encouragement under the sun wasn't going to change wasn't going to change jack's mind and interestingly where i was harangued over um over um uh, Declan Rice. That I played Declan Rice three times in the senior That's, side. Yeah. Three times. And Declan Rice, one particular uh, one particular game he played, he played, he played a, I mean, a 10-yard ball once. This is honestly, lads. He played a 10-yard ball that I seriously, that no one else on our side would have seen. He played the 10-yard ball and it was a terrific 10-yard ball because it cut the opposition down. And you could see even there at a young age that this lad had the talent, you know, had definite talent to play. Uh, whether he was going to make, make a central midfield player, which I always thought he would do. Sometimes I think that um, I think that West Ham uh, in his uh, in his days there were thinking even he might have made a centre half. I think he could have played in any of these positions. But certainly those three games I played him, I played uh, uh, played him in, and they're all friendly matches. So we really wanted to see it. But again, he's a decision to make. And while his dad was, and I went round to their house, uh, while their dad was very enthusiastic about Ireland for it, the decision is finally up to Declan. Mm. And Declan felt, as, uh, and I think his agent was strongly pushing for him. Did Declan see the career that he was having in front of him at the time? Uh, perhaps not. Did he, see, did he see an English career beckoning, where, whereas, uh, whereas maybe the Ireland thing, the chances are playing in a World Cup were going to be greater with playing for England, as it's been proved. So, but uh, but uh, Declan Rice wanted to play for England. It was really, really as simple as that. Much as he had sympathy and empathy for for the uh, for his time in Ireland, which was nice, great. But he played those games, and that's what he wanted to do. So the similar situation to the two, to the two of them. And I don't think you're right to try and coerce somebody. Encourage them, yes, if that's the case. But the decision is eventually up to them. So they weren't locked into a room with Roy Keane for forty-eight hours and fed water and bread. No, they, they didn't try that tactic. Is it? it might have worked, man. It might have worked. <laughs> we didn't. Yeah, I think the unchaining of the two of them was the difficult part. You know, so yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, absolutely. Yeah. That, that was it. But Martin, thank you so much. I, I, we, we're massively over time, but you've, you know, you've, you've, yes. you've, 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 you've given some really great insight into an awful lot of questions, um, you know, and an <laughs> awful lot of different parts of both, both Aston Villa, Celtic, and uh, and the Irish national team there as well. So really, really appreciate it's not, your not time. Absolutely, and honestly, delighted to, to talk to you. And when I when I finish this, I'm going to go back and scratch my head and put myself into a, a, a room, towel over my head in a dark room, and say. Falcao, Falcao, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Falcao. Are you sure about this? <laughs> Ask Ian Story Moore. Ian, did, did, did you did you ever did, did it ever come across very, the table? Very very good point. Very good point. <laughs> very good point. And great. Uh, well done, because then I can blame him if it did come up. <laughs> no, brilliant. No problem. All Excellent. Right. Well, Thank everybody, um, as I say, Martin's book is out on Pam McMillan. You'll be able to get it <laughs> on the link here in the podcast notes or in, under the YouTube notes as well. We will have it up on our Twitter as well. As I say, you've gotten a few snippets of the stories there, but if you want the real stuff, you've got to buy the book. And I'm sure it's going to be a massive stocking filler for this Christmas uh, uh, as well. But once again, Martin, thank you so much for your time. Thank Not you so time. much for your time at Aston Villa. And thank you so much for your time at, at the Irish national team as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing what the future holds for you. Are you, are you have you got any punditry gigs for the World Cup? Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was going to be working. I, I had a chance to go and work for a, a group called Astro, A-S-T-R-O, yes. Astro TV. Uh, but they were out of, in Kuala Lumpur. And um, and they were oh, very, very pleasant people, really lovely to work with, really genuinely worked. Uh, um, and I was going to be covering quarterfinal, semifinal and final for the World Cup. Um, um, my uh, my wife, who was going to come with me, had to have certain injections and things that you see that didn't really work out. And so yeah. I've had to decline. But overall, it's uh, yeah, but uh, they're really super group to work with, I must admit. And I do some I do some work with them during the course of the season. So that was yeah. that that was it. So I'm uh, I'm I'll be watching most of the football from uh, from the comfort of a, from a, a living room.
Excellent. Put stuff. your feet up. With, with a fire light, and I hope, Martin. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. absolutely. We, we, wish you, we wish you many more happy years and wish you the best of luck with the book. And again, That's very kind of you. Thank you thank very you much. So, thank you so much for your time. And thank you more than anything. Thank you so much for memories and on days like these. Thank you very much. We'll all remember. That's really thank nice you. of you. Thanks again. Excellent. All right. Cheerio. Oh, see you soon. So thanks everybody for watching the podcast. You can catch us on and uh, catch us on any of our uh, social media platforms. We'll be back with more podcasts. But in the interim, catch out Mar or watch out for Martin's book and uh, please give it a, a look. So until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and all that's left to say is up the villa, up the villa, the villa.